Hello, everybody. This is going to be a quick video lecture. Uh, it's either number two or seven, depending on how you count all the videos that have been released this week. Um, I hope that you're all uh, safe, isolated, and well. Um, if you are safe, isolated, and well, I hope that you are getting ahead on this class. Uh, this class is both simultaneously really well suited to um, go online. Uh, it has some problems with that. It's sort of designed to have somebody there to help you through the bumps and the rough spots. Um, but hopefully you all love uh, Professor Grossman's lecturing as much as I do and are blazing ahead because um, hopefully, uh, as I know some of you are already finished with Racket, which is outstanding. I definitely want to get this one done if you can so that problems that come up in all classes, including this one, uh, don't burn you in the end. So um, hopefully you're all appreciating that and getting ahead. Um, but I'll say also, oh, there's a wonderful link to Professor Grossman's outstanding uh, web page and everything like that. Okay, so um, I've also posted a uh, reverse stream uh, scenario uh, survey. It's a, I want everyone to fill that out by Thursday if you can. I'll give the reactions uh, or responses, uh, shoot a video of that this week so that we can get a little bit of interactivity in here. There's a little video that goes along with it. Um, and uh, just if everybody could uh, do that. This one scenario is, I want you to imagine your boss comes in, they know he discovers we have a reverse list function and we'll wants a reverse stream function. Uh, and asks how long it would take to build one. And I want you to just sort of talk about, or um, just fill out how you would uh, respond to that. Okay, so let's uh, dig into some of the uh, synthesis and question uh, uh, responses, uh, just an unbelievable, I can't get to all the people who, although they respect and appreciate uh, Professor Grossman's defense, eloquent defense of rackets parentheses, or what I'm going to refer to sometimes as lists parentheses, um, they're just not buying it. It just goes on and on and on of like, what the, why would anyone do this? Uh, like, I don't buy it. So uh, first of all, let me just sort of talk about why maybe and my thoughts on why. So uh, first of all, this is a timeline of uh, languages. It sort of ends in the 90s. Uh, language development seems to be going through even more uh, sort of a, uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff is going on right now. Um, but it goes all the way back to the 50s and here's Fortran and here's IPL, which is the predecessor to Lisp. But I want you to note the date that Lisp came out. So Lisp is uh, scheme, who is right up here's parent, if you will, and scheme evolved into racket. Okay, um, so I want you to imagine what it was like to build programs back in the 50s, right? Um, and it's hard to even think about how uh, how difficult it'd be. If you think about how easy it would be to build a parser where literally everything was a function and everything was separated um, by parentheses, I think. Uh, I, I didn't really think of it this way, but I like Professor Grossman's thing of like, it doesn't bother us that HTML has these uh, beginning and end brackets, right? The idea that maybe that I'd like, that's my guess is they just built it that way because it would be like the easiest way to build a uh, parser. Um, in many ways, maybe that's a happy accident because it does have some positives to it. You probably don't appreciate, a lot of you don't appreciate it right now. And I think that's fair. Um, but that would be my guess as to why this exists this way, is just because it would be very simple to build. And back in 1958, I would be looking for simple ways to build things, uh, too, honestly. OK, so um, and you know, it's just very hard to read and understand. I think this is legit. I would say the uh, editor helps a ton. I think Dr. Rackett, Rackett actually does a really good job of like matching up the friends and helping you there. Um, you probably noticed from some of the videos that I shot, I do that a lot. I sort of leverage the editor a bunch. Uh, I also use new lines a fair amount to try to help me break things up. Um, so those are a couple things that I do to try to get through it. Um, can we implement uh, another version of Racket without letting the programmer <laughs> explicitly write out parentheses? Because a lot of parentheses are annoying. So like, I think this is a legit question. I get where you're going from, uh, where you're coming from. What I'm going to say is that give it a little bit of time. Um, at the end of the day, you could build a racket that would not have the parens. Um, you could build a dynamic, functionally typed language uh, that had more like pick a language you like, like Python or Ruby or whatever syntax or Java, you know, whatever you want your syntax to look like. Um, and I think that would be a totally different language. I think there is something to just the simplicity of the parens. It's something about 
uh, the Lisp and the Lisp descendants um, that see where you are in a couple of weeks. Uh, but that would just no longer be a racket Lisp language if it didn't have that feature to it. I know it'd be a functionally dynamic one, and that's probably the most important thing. Um, but there is just something about just the simplicity of how the parens, everything has the same sort of rule uh, goes. Okay. Um, so I want to contrast um, ML. We just had this a second ago, and I kind of glossed over this, or I at least subconsciously made something to get around it. So when I built the a scenario, right, where we were building the sorted dictionary in under 15 minutes, and I made this entries, I at least subconsciously was like, I'm going to put this in unsorted entries in a val. I probably would not have, I definitely would not have made a let expression, except I also needed this sort compare, and I could have done that as a lambda here, but like I've done enough curried functions with parens where I'm just like, all right, I'm going to build sort compare just because it's going to be easier to see and everything like that. And so this function right now works, like this whole program works and everything like that. But I want you to imagine the rather reasonable version that I could have built, which is to just call sort with sort compare and this entries, right? And this no longer type checks. Oh, excuse me, let me save it. As I was saying, this no longer type checks. Like this is now grabbing this function and sending it in. Like it, like how could it pop? So now, like how do I fix this? I parenthesize this, right? And now all of a sudden it works, right? And so there's this thing where I'm not gonna try to, I'm not gonna expect everybody to be like, oh yeah, I love rackets parens now, right? But there's this very simple thing where, you know, I certainly when I, sometimes it happens even when I'm not currying, but like when I'm doing curry functions, I'm just constantly over parenthesizing things in, in ML, right? Because it's always, I'm like, why on earth would you grab the function instead of like what I call, right? And so, um, you know, not to mention this guy, when I write the, when I declare it, right? Like I've, I've had to parenthesize like declarations up here because it's grabbing, you know, the first one and not the other one. And so, um, what I'm gonna say is, again, I'm not gonna try to convince you right now that rackets parentheses are beautiful. Um, my hope is, is that some of you will start to see some of the value of it after a couple of weeks. Um, but just this, there is something too that eventually that some people, including myself, start to see as nice of, there's simply one rule. Everything's always parentheses, everything's always called as a function, and right? it's always does this way. And after a while you get sort of used to it. But there is also this bonus thing of um, there's never any guesswork about what it's going to do, right? Um, there's kind of this very reasonable, I would say, expectation when I was writing this code that, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grab this whole expression, not the function itself. And you never have those kind of questions in Lisp, largely because it's got one let's, I mean, it's not that simplistic, but it's got largely one rule and it goes with it all the time and you can count on it, okay? Um, and so I would say is like, my first argument is built in 1958, it's e easier on the person building the parser. And some would say that it's easier on the human too. Certainly people who are in this camp, definitely they bought it, right? I can understand if not everyone has at this point, but, Errors like this are uh, sort of uh, one of the reasons why I think people start to like the Lisp scheme racket stuff. Okay, um, would it be poor style to like just alternate parentheses and square brackets uh, like this? I'm sh yeah, and you probably just get burned at the stake if you did that. Um, I'm stunned that they have alternated it. I would have just gone with parens all the time and let it go. There is a convention to use the square brackets with cond, let, and syntax rules. Um, I looked up what the convention was. Uh, and that's the convention, so that's what I try to do. But um, yeah, don't alternate. <laughs> OK, so um, the editor will help you there. Like, it, I, I find it amazing that the Dr. Rack is like, you just type right paren, and it fills in right square brackets where you need it. It's actually a very nice little feature. There you go. Um, so if we're allowed to do this, like why not just write an entire set of macros that fixes this? And this gets back a little bit to my question of, 
there's if there's the part like there's the functional dynamic part of Lisp racket scheme, right? That is a very important thing. The other thing is that the simplicity of this one rule and just getting once you get used to it, plus x y doesn't bother you. It's kind of like um, uh, and again, just the whole thing of like uh, the the error that I showed, right? Like that's the thing that I'm sort of going with. You could maybe build this bonus thing where you could build equation as a function and then pass these symbols, right? And build it that way. But again, you're kind of like, uh, there's a little bit of the when in Rome kind of thing. Like just, it's probably better to just embrace either don't use racket or lisp ever, <laughs> right? Or embrace it and go with it and see if you can uh, start to appreciate it. Uh, it's the same sort of thing of, uh, don't I skate uphill? Like there are people who just love reverse Polish notation, right? And so, um, you know, give it a try. At very beginning, it's going to be very uncomfortable. After a while, sometimes uh, these things exist because there's some benefit to them. So give it a try. Um, little bonus thing, hopefully, uh, all of you have watched the Dr. Racket demo. I show a couple of things. One, how to click on an error for a stack trace. I show the documentation on the top right. I'll give a couple of bonus links here for people who are trying to debug things that there's some functions um, and there might be actually macros, trace and trace define to look into uh, for those of you who are struggling with debugging uh, particular programs. Okay, the other thing I want to point everybody to, hopefully everyone also watched my Racket image library at demo where I build a set of snow dudes. Um, and so hopefully that will help people. One of the, uh, here's some quick links to some library documentation on it. Um, one of the sad parts of us having to go offline, uh, there's a lot of sadder things going on right now than this. Um, but the uh, first, the probably when I ran this class last summer, the, the best, most well uh, executed session was the first session of Racket. And that was, everyone was digging into the home is where the heart is warm up. Right after it is the Cant is the Serpinski and Cantor studio. And so you're just getting used to the language, you're getting used to the syntax, you're getting used to the library and the editor and everything. And there's just somebody there to help you smooth over the edges, right? All the little problems that come up. Um, and so we're gonna lose out on that as we go remote. Um, it's again why the class is sort of built to like, it has this great set of lectures which help us go offline, but then it's all designed to have, you know, a lot of in-class time to work on things. So um, definitely I added these uh, quick videos to try to help get around that. Um, so definitely watch them. Certainly if you're struggling with anything, go back and watch it again. Um, but you know, uh, those are there as resources to help us get through and get going where uh, the in, in place situation is going. Um, I'll also say like the, the, um, the, uh, the wiki also points this out. If you're building this, if you start building the Serpinski triangle and you find yourself building a very complicated, it's a very tricky thing, you're not going down the right path. This is an, uh, the, the, it's almost as if the image library, I think it's from Northwestern, was built to make a beautiful solution to the Serpinski Triangle. So um, keep thinking about this. And if you struggle with it, uh, connect the, uh, with me on office hours and we'll talk about it. But a very elegant and simple solution builds this whole thing. And uh, the other ones aren't bad either. Okay. Um, could you go over delay and force again with a different example? Sure. Let's talk about, uh, let's do something in, uh, in Java for a minute. Okay. So uh, in JDK 8, they added lambdas, they added a bunch of things. They added, also added a bunch of interfaces so that you can um, pass them in. I made a lazy class for uh, CSE 231. Um, and uh, what it does is you tell it what to initialize. It doesn't do it yet, right? But when someone actually goes to call get, it will... Uh, make sure to uh, call this initializer, get it to actually do the initialization, and then use that same result over and over again. Um, and so this does a double checking uh, pattern to, uh, to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, but that's how that works. And so uh, this supplier, you can think of it as a thunk. It's a zero argument function. Um, if I click on it, um, it's something that has, uh, you know, 
of get and return some value, right? So that's kind of a lot like a thunk. A thunk. And um, this function right here, lazy making the constructor, is kind of like your delay, and uh, the get is kind of like forcing the value. Okay. Um, I use this when I make chromosomes resources. I, you know, like I have links to the NIH's um, thing for all of the chromosome data. And if somebody doesn't need all these, I don't want to delay running until somebody actually asks for it. If somebody asks for the Y chromosome or the X chromosome or 18, I don't want to go and look it up every time. I want to hang on to it once. So this is a very real version of where I use this. It was kind of nice to do that. You can see I have my, um, my lazy uh, instance right here, which tells you what to do when you get it, right? Download the file and then read it. Um, and so that's one example of how to sort of do this. Um, let's talk about another uh, way in which, you know, sort of delaying evaluation is a good idea. So uh, this is um, a word count example. I want you to imagine that what you want to do is read all the words of Shakespeare and you're going to find a count for all of them. So every time you, um, you find a new key, you're going to add one to, or this adds to its list. This is a lot like a MapReduce sort of thing. Um, I'm going to add one to it, and later I'll just have a list of all the ones, and I'll reduce it later. Okay. Now I want to ask everybody really quick. Pause the video when you're uh, to think about this. What is wrong with this code? So pause it, figure out what it is, and then move on. Okay, and we're back. And so, like, hopefully most of you figured out, like, this will return null. Those of you who are familiar with maps, when you call get on a key and it's not there, it's going to return null. So this is going to throw a null pointer exception. Pretty much if you have if you have at least one word, it's going to throw a null pointer exception. So what Java has additionally is this getter default method where you can pass any value here that you want. So in this case, I would pass. All right, so the values is getter default. So if it's null, please make the take this new list linked list and put it in. This will now work. But what is wrong with this code? And I want everyone to pause again and figure out what's wrong. Okay, and we're back. And so hopefully everyone sort of or a, a lot of people have sort of picked up on like, this would create and immediately throw away a ton of linked lists. So for every single the that came in, the first time you need to do this work, every other the in all of Shakespeare would make a new linked list, be like, oh, I don't need it, and throw it away. So for every repeated word in the entire thing that you're counting here, like you would just throw this away, right? And so that's a lot of wasted work. Um, and so what they end up, what, uh, Java has is map also has this computive absent, right? Which is in a way uh, has a way to delay this initial initialization, if you will. Um, and it will only call this method or only call this lambda if, you know, it's absent. So this is a good way to sort of uh, fix that. And so that's uh, the differences they provide both. One is, you know, nice and simple, but we'll evaluate this argument every time. And this one says, oh, you know, just call this and I'll make the new instance when I need it. Okay. Um, what are some examples of useful macros that are not in the language that are better suited as macros than functions? So first of all, let's talk about thunk that. Um, and I'll just let the students ask it to, uh, from their synthesis, right? Like, or answer it. Defining a macro that creates a thunk seems useful. Absolutely. So we have a bonus scenario. Um, I want you to imagine the thunk that uh, scenario. Uh, there's a uh, little extra video here. This one's not going to come with a survey, um, but it poses where you know your boss comes in and says, "Hey, all these lambdas everywhere are making our code less readable. Can you make um, a thunk that that would uh, you know thunk the argument that you pass? I need a function that does that." And so I'll pause, let everyone watch the video, and think about what you would do. Okay, and we're back. And so hopefully a lot of you sort of agree with our, uh, you know, our hero programmer here that, you know, it makes no sense to do this as a function. How can I write a function that delays the evaluation of its arguments? The language is going to evaluate that. So that's why I have to build a macro in this situation because um, I have to be able to, to insert code without calling a function that would uh, bundle up this thing into a, a, a lambda. In that way, and, and into a uh, into a thunk. Okay. Um, additionally, I'm going to say that I made the thunk in Stream Studio. Uh, this was largely because 
I found that homework four was just hard. Uh, it was hard for students and there was a lot of problems and it was hard to debug. And it felt like, um, let's make a studio that has you build a bunch of functions that you can then use in making homework four. Okay, um, there's a bunch of things they're all sort of described here, including sunk, sunk that, defunk that. Um, and I place them right in here. Okay, um, you know, you have to build thunk that as a macro, thunk uh, takes a thunk and just says, like, is this a zero argument function? Uh, strangely, uh, bracket calls them funk procedures. Uh, so you have, I give links to all the, the, the things that you need. Um, in the in the wiki, uh, dethunk that would just call it, right? Um, but there's a bunch of things here, and I'm going to highly encourage you to uh, to build these and then use them in your um, in your homework four. Now it was originally a studio, and it was required. Um, I am trying to think of ways to make it so that uh, this class is not as painful at a distance. And I envision somebody who was just struggling to get the studio to work. The entire studio was built to make homework four more palatable, and I didn't want to cause extra pain. So this is now not uh, required. It's now a warm up um, uh, for this semester uh, and any future semesters that have a, a similar problem uh, that we have right now. Um, so if you find yourself struggling with this and need to just move on to homework four, that's fine. But I, I highly recommend getting this to work. Uh, there's a, a a test program over here that will check to make sure everything's going. And if you have any uh, questions about it, uh, contact me about it and we'll get through it. But uh, that's why that's no longer required. Um, with that also, I will say like flow right in from that into homework four um, and uh, hopefully the uh, Thunken Streams uh, Studio slash now warm up will help on that front. Um, and with that, I'll say good luck, have fun. Um, and I'll be here to help. I've got uh, currently have um, office hours every night from eight to three, eight to nine thirty. Um, if those don't work for people, we will talk about ways in which to hopefully um, open up some new time for everybody. And with that, uh, good luck, have fun.